Give a warm welcome to our next speakers, a one-on-one -on -one with a dealmaker, moderated by James Kuhn, president of Newmark, and the dealmaker, Jonathan L. Mechanic, chair of the real estate department at Freed Frank Harris Shriver and Jacobson LLP. Please welcome our speakers. So I guess you can hear us, because I guess I can hear me. So um, I can certainly hear you. OK, well, that's all that really matters, right? They'll tape it and play it back for everybody later. So I'm sitting in Pershing Square, where I eat lunch by myself three days a week, and I read the Financial Times, having my chicken Caesar salad. And I go to the middle of the paper, where it's my favorite part, and I want to see which king, prince, CEO they're going to interview. And lo and behold, it's why everybody who's anybody in New York City real estate relies on John Mechanic. So I was flabbergasted to see, because I didn't think the Financial Times you know, sort of interviewed real estate people in New York, but I wasn't surprised. I know John longer than I want to admit, um, which because we're both old, right? We're mature. We're not old. OK. Um, so and then I had to think about what should be the title of the interview, and so I said, deal maker, because although John is a brilliant attorney, I don't think that's where anybody thinks of him. Um, John makes things happen. And I was thinking about you know, who were the deal makers when you think about the word, and I thought about Mike Milken, Henry Kravis, and then in real estate, Marty Turchin, who sort of revolutionized the brokerage business years ago, and then one of John's associates, Marty Edelman, who eventually you know, became the advisor to the Sheikh of Abu Dhabi and the third Fisher brother, they used to call him. Um, so I guess I want to start, though, with the no first nine years of your career where you were a lawyer, and then you went to work for Howard Ronson, and then you came back and became a partner in 87. So just briefly, what motivated you to leave the, the law profession to go to work for Howard, and what made you come back? Well, so I was a, a mid-level associate at Freed Frank, and we were doing a lot of work for Howard Ronson, who had a company called HRO uh, International. And Howard ended up building about two and a half million square feet of office space in New York, and we were doing a lot of things for him. And he basically took three people out of the firm, the guy who was my rabbi, a guy named Hal Rosen, me, and a more junior associate. And after six months, Howard and Hal didn't, see eye to eye. So Hal came back to Freed Frank, and I was supposed to go. And then Howard put the full court press on me about why this was an opportunity of a lifetime, and I should stay, become his general counsel, become a principal. It was like everything that real estate lawyers dream of. So I, I agreed I would stay for six months for transition, and then ultimately agreed I would stay uh, for, you know, for the foreseeable future. And I spent five years with Howard, and we built buildings like Tower 56 and 32 Old Slip. And, uh, and it was a great learning experience, and I saw the world from an owner's perspective, and I got to meet lots of people, like my friend Jimmy Kuhn over here. Um, but at some point, you were really dependent on one person. And I was going to get married, and I thought, well, Jesus, is this what, how I want to live my life? And I was going to go uh, back to practice. I thought that made more sense, and I had a unique perspective on things. Um, and speaking of Marty Edelman, I came very close to coming to Marty Edelman and being a partner at, at what was then Battle Fowler. And then my mentor and rabbi, Hal Rosen, invited me back to Freed Frank because we had had, when I stayed, he wasn't that happy. So we didn't talk for a little while, but we got over that. And I went back to Freed Frank. And I, I tell people I went back to Freed Frank for the lifestyle. Now, there aren't a lot of people who go to Wall Street law firms for the lifestyle. But compared to working for Howard, which was a 24-hour-a-day, seven-day-a-week job, it was really a lifestyle change. So I came back for the lifestyle, and I, I, I walked into the office, and, I, and they really wanted me because they were so busy that they really needed like a partner who would hit the ground running. And I got back, and all of a sudden, people started calling me, you know, not people that, of course, that were already clients of Freed Frank, but people I had been dealing with in the business community because I had both a legal hat and a business hat. And things led to things, and all of a sudden, the, the practice you know, took off. Yeah. So I think one of the things 
that, and I, I might compliment you too much, but you know. By the way, is there right. such a thing? <laughs> I, I thought I thought you can't be too rich and you can't be too thin. So, right. so I was gonna. I, what I was gonna say was that one of the things that have made you unique is you can be representing somebody on one deal and be across the table on the next deal, and because you have so many great clients that sometimes they're working on the same deal. And so I want to start going through some of the major transactions in New York, and John's been associated with most of them. So the first one, interestingly enough, is Stuyvesant Peter Cooper, which MetLife owned for a zillion years, built in 1948. Um, you represented Tishman Spire, and then they eventually didn't own it anymore, and then Blackstone ended up owning it, and, and you were on both transactions, different capacities, and I guess what I would ask you, since both of them ended up not performing like they would have liked for various and sundry reasons, so what your experience was and what were lessons learned, now you weren't obviously the acquisition you know, advisor, so you didn't pick the price or pick the asset, but you created the deal. And so, curious, that's a huge transaction, a lot of political risk, Rent stabilization, J51, any, anything going on in New York. So tell me about the, the well, Tishman deal and the Blackstone deal. Well, so the, 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 when we represented the Tishman Spire, um, you know, the, there was a lot of competition for the product. It was a huge, you know, multifamily complex in New York. And um, the, the competition was intense, but we ultimately, uh, won the competition and did a complicated financing, but the world at that point in time had, a, you know, a series of administrative rulings saying that you know it, you it, the fact that you had a J fifty one didn't preclude you from going to market rent with respect to units when when you qualified under the rent stabilization law, and then the world changed and there was a uh, a class action by tenants. Um, Claiming that that in fact there were, you weren't entitled to make some of the rent uh, resets that were in, you everyone thought you were entitled to under the law. So there was a dramatic change, and that impacted you know the value of the asset, and ultimately the asset was was transitioned under the control of the lender. Um, and then there was a dispute between the the first mortgage lender and some of the people up at the capital stack, and they were in the midst of a litigation. Uh, and I had relationships with both sides, and I ended up coming in to try and mediate that dispute, and they ended up making a deal with one another in a conference room late at night at 375 Park, and in, a, in a, a, a session that went all night because there was a litigation hearing the following morning, and we resolved it at three or four o'clock in the morning and then papered it because people wanted to make sure it was done. Um, and that led to a marketing process to market the project to third parties, and Blackstone ended up being the winning bidder, and Blackstone went and you know, had a bunch of meetings, had a regulatory agreement with the, with the city of New York, um, and ended up buying the asset, and it was a competitive process, but they bought the asset, and they had a vision for what the world was gonna look like going forward, and then there was the Emergency Tenant Protection Act, which again, changed the rules. And so I think one of the things that you realize is it, there is just a risk, it's a political risk, that notwithstanding that the world looks this way when you're buying an asset, depending on the, the asset class and the political situation, that the world can change having nothing to do with your pro formas and the, the numbers and what you think the market was gonna dictate. And, and I think I remember at the time, Blackstone had made a deal with the city that they would get going to guess at the number of a million square feet of air rights, which they could use somewhere in the area, but that never sort of happened, did it? Well, the, the, they had a regulatory agreement with the city which dictated what the, um, what the rents were going to be and, and basically had an affordable component. It was a, and it was a fair deal between the city and the owner, and they were a great owner, an institutional owner, for this kind of project. But then the, the state passed regulations that changed the rules. Um, and uh, you know there was a lot of politicking back and forth to try and circumvent that or try and overcome that, and and that didn't happen. They're still running the project. I mean, it's a beautiful project. It's beautifully maintained, but 
you know, there are, there are challenges. With I grew up there. I spent the first 25 years of my life in Peter Cooper and Stuyvesant, so I know the project well. We didn't have air conditioning, though, when I started there. So. But, that, but they improved that. Once, they, once you left, they decided they to bring left, in Yeah, air put air conditioning after I left. A lot of good at that, didn't they? Anyway, um, so then you represented Condé Nast in two major seminal neighborhood deals. One was in Times Square, and that was seminal in the sense that the original developer was George Klein. He never got to really do it. And a lot of these projects, we find the second developer makes the money. And then you took him to World Trade Center, um, and I guess along with Mary Ann Ty, and um, that was a significant deal for downtown. It was the first big non-financial tenant, I think, to go downtown. Talk about both those deals and the challenges and I guess I would also ask you, when you get brought in, what, what, when do you actually get brought into the deals? Um, long before it happens? Because you're also an advisor as well as an attorney. Um, so uh, we started on the Condé Nast transaction. They were on Madison Avenue. They were moving to Times Square. Times Square was a, a new neighborhood, and they were really a pioneer in terms of going there. And the city wanted them to go there. So there were lots of negotiations with the city. There was a lot of negotiation with Douglas Durst, who was the owner of the site, um, and, uh, and Mary Ann Tai, who is an extraordinary uh, broker and a, a legend in her, in her own right, um, was the, the you know, uh, catalyst for the deal. And she was a close relationship with Douglas and a close relationship with Condé Nast. And so we worked on that deal, and there were a lot of moving parts. Um, there were a lot of deals with the city. There were tax incentives to, to basically start, kick off Times Square as an office building uh, district. Um, so when we ultimately signed, uh, you know, there were, there were papers up to here in the conference room and lots of people, people from the city and people from Condé Nast and, 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 uh, and obviously from the Durst organization. Um, and uh, Cy Newhouse, who was the principal of Condé Nast, had two little dogs. And we came out to the conference room and there are piles everywhere. And he comes in and he's very, he's dressed very casually. Obviously he's, he's, a, he's a, 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 was a legend and had built this company. Um, and so we have all these papers out and he says, I'm allowed to bring my dogs into the building, correct? I said, yeah, absolutely. It's in section 3702 little i, you know? <laughs> and we turned to 3702 little i, and not only do you have the right to bring in dogs, but you have the right to bring in replacement dogs, because you never know. Um, and, uh, and it really was the beginning of the development in Times Square. And then you had Reuters, and you had the other deals that got made, um, made in Times Square. And I think, you know, the new houses were, were visionaries, and, Again, the new houses coupled with uh, Condé Nast, with, uh, with Marianne, ended up looking at the Trade Center, and the Trade Center at that point in time was needed this major tenant to... Before you get there, uh, when, you, when Big Tenant makes deal with the city in those days, they got a lot of incentives, and, and was, there, was the time period, the, the gardening leave, we might say, that they were allowed to leave Times Square without giving anything up? And move well, they were, they were there, they were at Times Square for, I, I think, 15 of the 20 year period. So the bulk of what they were committed to had been expended. So they, they had honored their commitments in that regard. And there may have been some give up at the, the last couple of years of the lease. But there were also incentives to go to the Trade Center because the, the city and state, everybody wanted the downtown development to become successful. And so, and, and the notion was it was like, uh, you know, the, the 2.0 of the transaction, because all, almost all the team members of the, were the same, including um, Douglas Thurst, because Douglas Thurst had made a deal with the Port Authority to become the developer and the leasing agent of for World Trade Center. So it was, we were, we were, we were in another, you know, Thurst conference room talking about the transaction, talking about all the different things that go into it, talking about the construction and the timing and what happens if the building doesn't get done on time and, they, you know, and, and their obligations under the lease at, uh, at, at Times Square. So all those conversations were taking place with virtually the same people that they'd taken place with 15 or 20 years earlier 
for the Times Square transaction. So it was like bringing the band back together again. And had they thought about asking for equity in the project or no? I think they were, they were focused on getting a, a compelling economic deal because they were, they were really bringing something to the city and something to lower Manhattan in terms of credibility for the, for the overall development. And so I don't think they were focused much on having an equity interest in the building. Plus it's complicated being a partner with the Port Authority and Douglas Thirst already had a, a, you know, a, a complicated arrangement with the Port Authority. So th I think they were mostly focused on their cost of occupancy. Yeah. So let's switch gears to another seminal project in New York um, that I know a little bit about. Um, so when the city first looked at what we now call Hudson Yards, they actually thought of it as the stadium for the Jets, and that didn't happen. It was a whole host of- By the way, we represented the Jets. And I wrote the opinion letter saying it was okay for them to go there because nobody else would sign it. <laughs> That's how smart I am. Um, and then- uh, I hope you frame that. No. <laughs> and then Ann Weisbrod, who was head of HYBC, asked me to come work with Dan Doktoroff, who's a really good friend, and sadly he's you know, got some issues. Um, but it was an amazing project, and I remember going there the first day when there was nothing on the table and it was this rail yards and trying to figure or vision what could be built there and how they were gonna do it. And, and ultimately, one of the biggest questions we had was how was somebody gonna get this, the platform, a $2 billion platform over the yards built on spec because that was what we thought would happen. And um, to make a long story short, after we wrote the RFP and worked with the community board and we got the RFP out, it, it came down to related versus Vernado. I recused myself because I still own Vernado stock because we sold our company, it's a whole different story. But, um, but you were involved in a lot of different places, but before we get to the tenant side, let's talk about the transaction because it was unique and you can fill in the blanks, but you know, Steve Ross was clever. That it was not the best economic times when he signed on for the deal. Tishman Spire had been designated before, and I don't know if you're involved in that too. I was. We, we, we represented Tishman Spire. There had been a letter of intent that had been signed. And then Merrill Lynch on, and Lehman fell apart. And, and then the wall started to yeah. crater, and there were some issues with the MTA, and that deal ended up not happening. Right. And so, so uh, but the negotiation, uh, for the ground lease was interesting because number one, Steve had put some conditions that he didn't have to start building and taking it down until then. And then originally it was gonna be a lease, but then he had the option to buy the sites. But why don't you talk about first the challenges in, you, you incurred or Steve incurred in trying to get this done? Well, so there was a letter of intent that was signed by Related that we weren't involved in because we'd been involved on the Tishman's fire side. And then when they went forward, they, the, the world again changed. So before, there were the, as they were getting documents done, they ended up entering into an agreement which basically had three triggers to go forward. Because you couldn't, the, the market was such that you couldn't go forward. And they had triggers based on uh, construction, based on supply, based on a series of factors, based on leasing, which would be, when those things came together, then there was an obligation to move forward. I think when it, the transaction actually came together, I'm not sure that all those triggers were triggered, but there, what, what ultimately happened was, um, uh, first of all, we had a, a series of negotiations with the MTA and Steve Lefkowitz, who many of you may know, Steve Lefkowitz was uh, you know, a, a dean of the land use bar and a partner and a dear friend. And unfortunately, Stephen passed away within the last couple of weeks. But Stephen was, had, had the vision to see, like the related people and like Dan Dockeroff and yourself, what could happen there. So we, Stephen and I spent a lot of quality time together um, dealing with the MTA and, having, uh, uh, and working on the ground leases. And the, the transactions were such that you would have a ground lease until the building was built and then you had a, the option to purchase the individual sites. And in effect, as you did each site, you would create the, the platform. And Steve needed that because in the early going, he was gonna build the community by 
selling to the big tenants to start out, right? Yeah, and the notion was that there were uh, four office building sites and that that would be the core of the, the, the uh, east side of the, uh, of the rail yards. And uh, the first major tenant, again, different than what was, I think, anticipated, turned out to be Coach, and I, I actually represented Coach. So now I moved to the other side of the table and spent a lot of quality time. You like with. have a bunch of conflict waivers <laughs> sitting on the sidelines, I, and you just give them out? I, I, I like to say it's like the first piece of paper that gets signed in any transaction, because the likelihood of having a relationship with somebody on the other side is, is excellent. But, but I, I think what, what I've learned, and I think you know, the people I've dealt with, is that having a relationship with somebody on the other side, if both people want to make a transaction and get at the conclusion, having somebody who, who has integrity, whom you trust, and who's trying to get to the solution, a solution that works for everybody. If, if a deal is too one-sided, generally they don't get done. So um, the coach transaction had a lot in it for coach. It was, it was a seminal transaction for getting Hudson Yards off the ground. I spent a lot of quality time with my friends that related on the other side. Um, and I think we came with, uh, with a, a complicated solution. There was a, um, they were gonna buy, in effect, a condominium interest in the building that was gonna be built at 10 Hudson Yards um, because related was using debt and equity. We needed to have debt and equity, but we couldn't, in fact, control the, the debt in an, in, an, in an asset which we were gonna be the equity. So what we did was, and I think this is, common in certain ways in the lending industry is that with respect to the coach debt, the coach debt was pari passu with the Starwood debt, which was the related lender, but Starwood made all the decisions. So in terms of where we stood in the capital stack, we were exactly in the same pace as related where they had equity, we had equity, and where they had debt, we had debt, but we couldn't control the debt. So the debt was like a real third party lender, except in our value and what we put in, we were exactly where we should be as a, quote, 50% owner of ultimately the building that was going to get built. And they did one on their balance sheet? They did a sell lease back? Well, so... Before the accounting rules. Well, okay, so what happened was they originally were going to own this, own the, uh, their condominium unit in 10 Hudson Yards. And then, you know, it takes time from the time you visualize everything until the building gets built and you can take occupancy. And uh, the world had changed in terms of the economics of the world and they had created real value. There was huge value in what they'd created. So instead of realizing the value by owning and occupying their own unit, they ended up effectively selling the unit back to Related. Related bought in Allianz as a partner and Related now owned the whole building instead of Coach owning half the building and Related owning half the building and they took back a long-term lease on the building. And I guess there's always a question a tenant like that Yes, they're going to get their non disturbance in the term agreement, and but but there's always a concern. What happens? Who's running the property? If there's a default, if there's a bankruptcy, if there's a foreclosure. You, I mean, you had to deal with all that. So there were um, there were guarantees of completion. There were guarantees of completion that went to the lender. There were guarantees of completion that went to to coach. There was uh, um, the the lender's right to, in effect, complete the building was ahead of coach's right because the lender seem to be better able to actually do this because that's what it does for a living. Right. And Coach does other things for a living. But there was a right, if, if the lender didn't do it, for Coach to come in and do it. And there was a non-disturbance agreement in favor of Coach. There were all those things. And that's why it took, you know, close to a year to get the transaction done from the time it was announced. It was announced, there was a signed letter of intent, there was a, the mayor showed up, it was all great. And then there all the work, the, the legal work, real legal work had to begin. And it was a very complicated deal, but I think that the, the, the strength of the relationships on all sides allowed it to happen and allowed it to find a solution to things. Talk for a second. When, when, we, do these, when, when do, we do these massive deals on development, the tenant always has the issue, what happens if it doesn't get built on time? Who's covering my holdover costs in my existing building? And when do I have the right to kick out of the project? Tell me how you think about that. So I, I think uh, when you do that, first of all, 
you obviously need to see what your expiration dates are on your leases. I mean, for example, when Condé Nast went to um, World Trade Center, they had time left on their lease, and part of the transaction was that the Port Authority was going to take over whatever the stub period was. But there were complexities because there was a there was a time period that they were supposed to complete construction, but if it went too long, then you would almost run out of the stub period that you had on the lease, and then you had to exercise an option in order to make sure that you had a place to be. But if you exercised an option, now you're increasing the Port Authority's obligation with respect to that lease because now it was five years longer. So what were the circumstances under which you could exercise the option and be protected that you were still, if, if, if there were two or three years left, under the extended lease, that was still the, the, the uh, new landlord's obligation. So those negotiations, and they are critical to any transaction like this, what happens if it doesn't go exactly as planned? And we all know that things never go exactly Especially as planned. Especially in development. Right, especially in development. And there are things that come in, I, I don't know if anybody's heard of COVID-19, but, <laughs> but there, there are things that happen that you just can't predict. And so, um, you need to provide for that, and that's a combination of the business people and the lawyers trying to fashion a result where that, that risk is allocated to one or another, or in some cases, shared in some way. Right. So, you know, once the seven line was built and operating, the next project after Hudson Yards was Brookfield's Manhattan Center. Manhattan West. Manhattan West. And I remember years ago, we both probably remember when Harvey Schulweis owned that site, I don't think I ever envisioned something like the Brookfield project to be done and get completed and be successful. And once again, you represented the large tenant, one of the large tenants that made the project, which was E and Y. Well, we represented, for the most part, we represented Brookfield. Brookfield. We represented Brookfield on acquiring the site going back to way back when, back to O and Y days, which is where the site started. And Harvey Schulweis had a piece of the right. site, not the whole site. Right. And then ultimately Harvey's interest was acquired by Brookfield and now they had control of the whole site. Um, and uh, the, uh, the, and several of my partners, Meyer Last and Jenya Shah, represented Brookfield on, um, on doing the leasing at Manhattan West. And there's a, another partner who who uh, unfortunately passed away during COVID, named Joshua Mermelstein. And Joshua had a relationship with, with Brookfield that goes back to ONY from when he was a sixth year associate and Josh was 65. So, so Josh had this relationship through the, the entire acquisition, buying out Harvey Schulweis, doing the financings, creating the platform, putting up the buildings, um, and the good news is that he did see the opening of Manhattan West. Manhattan West had an opening. Everybody came to the opening. Right. And Josh had lived with it for 30 years. Right. So, um, so that was extraordinary. And the one we, we had represented every uh, Brookfield on every lease at Manhattan West other than Ernst & Young. And Ernst & Young I were on the other side because I represented Ernst & Young. So I had my friends from Brookfield sitting across the table and Katie Kane, who is the general counsel of Brookfield and a superstar, was sitting at the table. And we spent lots of time together, but we spent time across the table from one another. And again, it was helpful because we, we, we found solutions to things. We found ways to protect E&Y, but also not in a way that was going to be in, impossible for Brookfield to accept. You think, do you see major differences, philosophical differences, or development differences between the Hudson Yards project and the Manhattan West project? I think the, 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 the Hudson Yards project um, has more components to it. Um, you know, 10 Hudson Yards was the first, but then they made the deal with uh, Time Warner for, I think it's 30, and we actually represented Time Warner. So there again, we kind of switched to the other side of the table, and that was the key and that was an owner occupier because Time Warner, you know, bought its space, um, and then and that I think changed the nature of that building. Much of that building were people buying, in effect, condominium units like KKR. Right. So um, I, I, I think that that the related project just 
has a broader scope in terms of the number of properties. And there's the whole west side of the west side yards, which is yet to be developed, and platform needs to be built. And uh, if, if the, the thing that's unbelievable is, is if you go to, uh, to Hudson Yards and you look out over the western rail yards and realize that we are sitting in this huge complex with multiple office buildings and residential buildings and the retail center and part of that is now being converted to office and all the things that are going on there. And if you look out at the western part of the rail yards, that's what it looked like. 15 yeah. years ago, it's mind boggling. And, and what was mind boggling to me when I was working with Dan Doctoroff was we had to negotiate how many tracks we could take out of operation during construction because it was an active rail yard. So the whole west side is a phenomenal story. But now let's sort of move east and talk about one Vanderbilt. You know, Grand Central is a great place for commutations in from Westchester, Connecticut but it lacked a product for a very long time. And so I'm not sure that anybody thought the Plaza District ambiance was gonna filter down to 42nd Street, and SF Green built this amazing building, but not without complexities, not without the MTA. And I wonder if you wanna talk about it because you were very involved. Well, so we, we were involved, and again, um, Stephen Lefkowitz and another partner of ours, David Karnofsky, who was uh, general counsel of city planning for about 10, 10 or 12 years before he came to Freed Frank. Um, and uh, there had been a bunch of discussions with the owners of the development rights above Grand Central to move those developments to the site that, that Mark Holliday and S.L. Green had developed. But there was someone who controlled, who was the that control Andrew person. Penson's deal? That was Andrew Penson's deal. And Andrew Penson controlled it and he had a vision that if the, if the development rights were worth 10, he thought they were worth 50. And if, he, if they were worth 20, then they're worth 100. And so uh, S.L. Green and the partnership that owned the development rights could never make a deal. And ultimately, uh, we worked with S.L. Green and made a deal with the MTA and the city to create the Vanderbilt Corridor, which was the concept of that corridor that fronts one Vanderbilt and you know, it's a, a, a fabulous addition to the city, but it allowed you to pay money to the MTA for uh, public improvements and therefore acquire additional developments by doing that as opposed to buying development rights from an adjacent site. And this was before East Midtown zoning. So uh, the Vancouver, I mean the, uh, um, the Vanderbilt corridor was created. There was the ability to transfer development rights or to buy development rights from, from, from the city. And they bought, they spent $240 million to create what is one of the, you know, most extraordinary buildings in the city and to create an ambiance in front of the building, with, which is the, you know, the plaza, which I think is, you know, beautifully done and people love it and people love coming into the building and they designed the spectacular building. Um, and they are getting rents in the building that are, you know, at the top of the charts, so to speak. And, and you had to have a vision and you had to have, you know, the confidence to go forward, given that that was being built <coughs> right through COVID. So the notion that you're, you had a vision and you were, you were just going forward, um, they had made a deal with Toronto Dominion, which my partner Rob Soren had done with them, where Toronto Dominion was moved out of the site with the right to come back into the site. But I don't think Logan anybody Park. envisioned triple digit rents at that site. I, I, I think they may not be as high as they have ultimately achieved, but I think because of the cost of construction and the cost of buying development rights, I think they, they believe that they were getting those kinds of rents, just not, not the lofty heights that they've right. achieved. And I guess Scott Reckler and partners are gonna hopefully follow that with the project at the high. Well, so we, we're actually working with Scott what Reckler. What a surprise. We're, we're working with Scott Reckler. So the, the partnership that owns the development rights above Grand Central is uh, uh, TF Cornerstone and Scott. And the, there was a third party, which is MSD Capital. MSD Capital has since had its interest bought out, but they, uh, they were introduced to somebody we know um, to, uh, to Scott, and that ended up forming the partnership. Um, 
And so some of the development rights of above Grand Central will move to the J.P. Morgan headquarters at 270 Park, and the other ones are to be moved to above the Hyatt to create what they're calling 175 Park. And it is an extraordinary building, and it's a building that's meant to match one Vanderbilt and, again, change the whole complexion right. of that area so that right. it, you'd have uh, anchoring that part of Park Avenue, in effect, one Vanderbilt right. and 175 Park. So we're going to start soon referring to you as the second Robert Moses, because now we're going to move up in the revitalization or the new 2.0 of Park Avenue, and you're involved in two projects there, or you are certainly on 270, um, helping J.P. Morgan with the air rights. We, we bought the air rights from Grand Central um, and moved them up to 270 Park to create a building that actually justified uh, J.P. Morgan knocking down an existing skyscraper on Park Avenue, taking it down, and then rebuilding what will be, like one being one of the most extraordinary buildings in New York City. Um, and uh, um, I, you, all you have to do is drive down Park Avenue and see this mammoth structure that's going up. Right. And if traffic wasn't bad enough, now you're going to create more traffic because now you, you're involved with Ken Griffin and Vernado and Rudin in a 1.7 million square foot building that's going to get built at 350 Park, right? Right. So, I mean, and again, in terms of, for the people in this room, feeling good about the potential for New York City and the vibrancy of New York City. When you see 270 Park going up and you see the commitment by Citadel to 350 Park, and again, you're taking down existing skyscrapers, 350 and 40 East 52nd Street, which is a Rudin building, and they're meant to come down. And Sir Norman Foster, who designed 270 Park, and is also the person who's designing 350 Park, um, uh, is designing a new headquarters for Citadel and a complicated deal with um, master leases of the existing buildings for a period of time to give people time to do the design of the new building, get the governmental approvals to increase the floor area, um, and, uh, and uh, get the approvals to build the building that's going to work for a trading company like Citadel, much like uh, J.P. Morgan. J.P. Morgan, in order to build its building and in order to accommodate trading floors, had to get some modifications of the zoning rules to allow that to occur. Who's your client in that myriad of masters of the universe? Um, so on that transaction, we represented Citadel in doing the deal with Vernado and Rudin, but we do work for Rudin and for Vernado in other circumstances. And we're also land use counsel for the development in terms of getting the approvals to build the building that they want to build. So we, we touch a lot of different places. Yeah. Um, it's interesting because if you think about what Citadel has done between New York and Florida, and not in Chicago, right? It's extraordinary. They're, they're creating mini neighborhoods in all these areas. I don't know where else you may have dealt with Ken Griffin, but it's kind of mind-boggling, isn't it? Well, listen, I think he's obviously a, a, a genius and um, has built an extraordinary business. Uh, and I think he's got a, a, a center here in New York. And so this deal, which was a complicated deal with Rudin and, and, and Bornado, and I think there was a, a relationship there which made it easier to get that done. And I think he has a vision for what he's doing in Miami. We're actually working with him in Miami on creating the, the headquarters that they're doing in Miami as well. You're spending a lot of time with my partner, Neil Goldmacher, who represents Citadel. Uh, yeah. We did spend a lot of quality time with Neil Goldmacher in terms of negotiating the lease with Bornado. Yeah. And, and Neil may be the predecessor to Mary Ann Tai. I'm a little biased there, but I think Neil is one of the great brokers now in New York and you know, younger than Mary Ann. So. But in any case, don't tell Marianne that. Okay. <laughs> um, so now let's pivot to, to a deal that's implications are more important than the deal. And what I mean is, so you represent Nate Berman, who was pretty famous in New York for, for converting office buildings to multifamily. And we were actually on the other side in, in various capacities. Um, selling the deal, or if you want to say 
not selling, but re recreating or restructuring a deal um, that Nate Berman bought with my former partner, Jeff Corral, um, at 20, called Net 25 Water. JP Morgan was a secondary headquarters, sort of a terrible, awful, one of the worst buildings I've ever seen in New York. No window. But, <laughs> but, by the way, that, that's not meant to be a compliment. It, right. But it is changing. It will be a whole new building. Well, that's the point. So, you know, everybody has been talking about the fact, and I'm going to just extrapolate a little bit here, is New York has about 450 million square feet of office space. You heard the first panel talk about B office, B minus office. We don't need 450 million square feet of office space anymore. Maybe we need 350, maybe we need 300. But in any case, it means that there's going to be 300 million square feet that's going to still exist as office. But what do you do with the rest? There's no 421A today. There's no G51 today. The mayor is trying hard to, to, to do this through zoning. But without tax incentives, it's hard to do. But here, um, Nate Berman and GFP decided they would take a 1.2 million square foot building with large floor plates, drop two light wells in, and create an abundance of apartments. And I guess I would ask you to talk about two parts of this. <coughs> One, the challenges that the, that the buyers had in determining <coughs> whether this could work without tax incentives. And then I'd love your vision or your optimism or lack of optimism <coughs> on converting office buildings to multifamily. And I'm not talking about any building. We know not every building works. But the economic and financial abilities going forward and how do you think the city council and the state of and, and, and Albany and the mayor will ever come to grips with this and create housing because some part of that will be affordable ultimately. And I just talk about it. So, uh, I mean, I think the transaction was fascinating. It was, so Nathan Berman, who's got a company called Metroloft, ended up partnering, partnering with the Graal family office. And the two of them ended up partnering with Rockwood who was the financial partner. And then the three of them ended up borrowing money from MSD Capital. And we have extraordinary relationships with everybody at the table. And then the, the deal that made this really work for everybody is that JP Morgan had a, uh, a lease in the building that went out for several years, but really wasn't occupying the building in the way that they needed to, so that they were happy to exit early. but. Um, there was a deal that was negotiated with the help of an intermediary um, to have uh, J.P. Morgan terminate its lease early, make a termination payment, but with a discounted number so that they were getting a benefit, the owner was getting a benefit, and all that money was being paid to the existing lender, which was had a purchase price for its debt. So to the extent the price was $100, and the prepayment was twenty-five dollars. Now the, 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 they were buying the debt for seventy-five instead of a hundred. So that what the basis down on the property and allowed them to go forward um, and build the kind of uh, building and make the kind of changes to the building that made it economic. Yeah, and the viable. effect, the effective price per foot, I think, according to Brian Starwitzel, was under two hundred dollars a buildable foot, which is probably where you need to be for quote land value to be able to create these significantly yeah. under. Yeah. Um, and so what they're doing is really changing the whole uh, project to something that was an office building that was really designed almost for computer use to a, a residential tower with new curtain wall going up and, and with views and light and air. And I think they're having something like 150,000 square feet of amenities, uh, pickleball courts, squash courts, and just everything you could imagine to make this uh, a, a user-friendly location for people, you know, who, who want to, uh, you know, have their careers in New York. And for me, it's extraordinarily helpful because it's actually right across the street from our downtown office. So uh, it'll make it a very easy commute for people who want to walk across the street to go to work um, and play pickleball late in the day when they get home. So and and, and, I, and I, let me go back to my second question, and and it's a hard question to, for you to answer without trying not to be political. Um, but this city, as, it, as is LA and San Francisco, they're all political. But do, do you have a feeling that in the city's best interest to create some affordable housing or any housing whatsoever, 
can't guess whether 420A will come back, but will they create some tax incentive, do you think, that will make conversions viable for housing in New York City in the next five years? I, I think they need to. I think they need to more broadly. Um, 421A and people who are familiar with the, the program, um, there are people who actually uh, got foundations in the ground and there was an artificial limitation that you had to complete the building by 2026. And there was a bill to extend that so that that time period was pushed out to 2030 so that no one would get caught because what happens, and obviously everyone in this room is familiar with financing, if you're a lender and you have this artificial deadline of 2026, and things can go wrong in development. So when you start underwriting, you say, well, I gotta, I gotta know you're gonna be done a year earlier than that. So I have a year cushion. And that, that time kept on getting truncated. So projects that were qualified never got started. I have several of them where people just wouldn't move forward because there wasn't enough time. So the notion was that there would be an extender bill and people thought that was gonna get passed and it didn't happen. So there's a lot of pressure uh, brought on the state legislature to both do an extender bill on 421A and really to do a new 421A, call it whatever you want. But in order to build the housing that's so necessary in this city, that's something that we clearly need. And the question is you know, how we get our um, legislative bodies to recognize that. And if you look at the downtown plan, and you and I both remember, there were a lot of uh, the older buildings downtown that were caught up in, like, in, in obsolescence. And so there was a downtown plan which gave tax incentives for converting those buildings to residential. And a lot of those buildings have been converted to residential and that's what was helped make downtown more of a 24 hour community. I think that's what they need to do. They need to do something which induces people to make the economics work. You can't do it without the economics making any sense. So I usually end, end these interviews that I've had everybody from John Gray to Barry Sterling here, and I, I usually ask the question, what keeps you up at night? But I don't think I'm gonna do that because between Israel and Ukraine and interest rates and the Middle East and everything going on, it's enough to keep us all awake. So. That is what keeps, that is exactly what keeps me up at night. And I, I would say the other thing is that some of the things going on in our own country um, with, with the division and uh, the people who I don't necessarily see exactly what, what transpired in the Mideast and, um, and what the consequences were for people there. So um, I think that keeps us all up at night. And in the scheme of all the things we're dealing with, and there are challenges, the challenges there are much more extreme. John Mechanic, thanks for doing this, my friend. Thank you.